All right, so um, hi, welcome everyone. Um, today, it's my pleasure to introduce our QFARM speaker, Professor Natalia Berloff from Cambridge University. Um, Professor Berloff earned her undergraduate degree from Lomonosov Moscow State University and her PhD from Florida State University, and then was on the faculty at University of California, Los Angeles. Since 2002, she's been a professor of applied mathematics at the University of Cambridge, as well as the fellow and director of studies in mathematics at Jesus College in Cambridge. Um, she's done work in quantum hydrodynamics, nonlinear waves, analog Hamiltonian simulators, and optical computing. And um, today, we're very excited to hear her talk about recent work on polariton graph simulators. Um, so as always, please put questions for the speaker in the chat box. And Professor Berlava, I'll let you take it away. OK. All right, uh, so many thanks for invitation. Of course, it would be so much better to be in person, um, but still it's very nice to uh, to talk to, um, to this uh, audience. So indeed, I will be talking about polariton graph simulators, um, and that's what I mean by liquid light, but I also wanted to put it in a wider uh, context of various systems, optical, laser, photon, etc., systems that uh, kind of operate with the same idea in mind. So I will try to extract what we understood about uh, pol um, uh, polariton simulators and put it in a wider context. And what you see on this slide on the left is a kind of schematics of polariton simulator where we imprint, optically imprint polariton condensates in such a way that they arrange their phases to minimize, uh, to find the global minimum of a spin Hamiltonian. And on the right, you see the actual implementation. Um, it's a lattice of about 1000 of condensates all coherently coupled with um, a particular phase, um, phase difference. Um, so I lead quantum fluids group at Cambridge, um, and we are part of the applied math section of the Department of Applied Math and Theoretical Physics, because as you probably know, in Cambridge, there is Cavendish, and then there is Applied Math and Theoretical Physics, and Applied Math really has all flavors of fluids, and I represent quantum fluids. So we are historically um, been interested in uh, fundamental aspects of superfluid behavior, um, properties, excitations, modeling, trying to understand different, different systems from um, ultra cold BC in atoms to superfluid helium, and then uh, more recently non-equilibrium systems, polariton condensates, magnon condensates, etc. But about five, six, seven years ago, we uh, started looking at application, and of course the idea of what can we do with, uh, with the condensates arranged in a lattice came about. So that gave rise then to this um, uh, looking at it as the simulator. And since then, we started looking into a wider context of what we can actually do and what lessons we can take in terms of the uh, building classical and quantum simulators um, and what are really these uh, common principles of operation that many optical uh, systems and quantum systems share. And in our quest for, to understand that, we uh, started collaborating also with the Microsoft, Microsoft Cambridge, that are also very interested in actually building building some of the this um, implementing of some of these ideas and in my talk i will really uh, um, um, uh, between the members of my group i will be talking about work done with kirill kalinin um, and nikita stroyev two phd students one is in cambridge one is now based in uh, skoltech so the common principle for this platform, so and why we would like to use physical systems to start with, is to uh, try to solve optimization problems. So the big picture for these machines is that we have some real life problem, and it could come, you know, the splash words from artificial intelligence, from machine learning, from trying to find new materials. It really doesn't matter what is the problem, uh, but the task is to find the global minimum of some complex function that depends on many variables, therefore lives in a highly dimension, high dimensional hyperspace. 
and it has a, a lot of local minima and local maxima, and we're trying to find the best solution. So really, we're trying to find uh, the global minimum, the absolute minimum, while it's very um, easy to get uh, for any method to get trapped in a low trapped in a local minimum. But then we know that mathematically, the mathematically rigorous statement, then we can start with this optimization problems, the wider class optimization problems, and we can always map them onto problem in the graph, where each variable of the original problem is mapped onto one or several nodes of a graph, and the structure of the function is mapped into the connections between the nodes, the couplings, the interaction strengths between the nodes. And then the structure of the function is reflected in a particular structure of, of the graph, of the co graph connectivity. But then now this is a, this is rather um, elementary statement that of course such graph structure can be viewed as finding the global minimum of a particular spin Hamiltonian and it could be the spin Hamiltonian that depends on continuous variables or discrete variables it could also be k local Hamiltonian etc. So this is the idea beyond uh, the idea that physical system can perhaps help us to solve the optimization problem because, because maybe we can build such a system and in the process of finding the ground state of the corresponding classical Hamiltonian, it may help us to solve the problem. Or oh, again, this little example, again, just putting it uh, on a particular example. So again, starting with minimization of the function that depends on, let's say, k variables, we can map these k variables, k unknowns, uh, into, uh, into thetas and thetas. And then this problem uh, reduces to minimizing, in this case, I put it as the classical xy Hamiltonian where we make the summation and then there is a coupling strength between i and j's element represented by these couplings j i j. And then depending on the nature of our new variable, it could be a variable on the interval between uh, 0 and 2 pi, then it's a classical xy Hamiltonian, or it could be discretized, it could be limited to just discrete values. If it's limited to two values, we're dealing with Ising Hamiltonian without transverse fields in this, in this setting. Or if we have more than two discrete variables, this is sports or clock model. Okay. Um, so one slide on why classical uh, conventional computing is not enough for solving some uh, some problems and here this is this is the uh, very uh, rough um, uh, rough table that depending on the size of the problem so depending on how many variables i have for my functional how many nodes i have in, in my graph classical computer is very efficient in solving some of these problems um, if the problem is easy, for instance, convex, then the problems can be easily solved, except that when they become too large. So when we go to the numbers of tens of billions variables, for instance, in the search engines that have to deal with tens of billions or hundreds of billions uh, web pages, then the classical computer um, is not capable of really producing us the results efficiently fast. But then we also have the hardness of the problem and simply even taking the brute force search. Um, but once I start increasing the size of the problem, that becomes uh, infeasible. So the classical com computer would not be able to solve the problem. So this is where we, try, we, we hope that the unconventional computer can do something better. It's not about changing the, um, the, the, the um, asymptotic scaling of the problem. It's not about solving NP-hard problems faster than exponential. We know this, is, this can never be done. But this is still doing with limited resources, finding perhaps better solution or finding the solution faster for a given size of the problem. And this is the, uh, the diagram that actually Kirill, Kirill Kalin, my PG student, produced by analyzing different, um, uh, different supercomputers and the dedicated hardware. He put this point starting with CPUs and go into GPUs and uh, um, FPGAs, etc. He put them as the points on, um, on the chart representing the computer power uh, in teraflops and the energy efficiency. 
And this is where we hope that unconventional computing can make, make a difference, that we hope that it can uh, offer the speed up and the energy efficiency that other, um, other devices and other um, dedicated hardware was unable to, uh, to fulfill. Okay, so what if I start um, formulating the requirements for a physical simulator that follows this procedure? I map the problem into the spin Hamiltonian and I create the physical system that by its action, by um, it, uh, the natural dynamics of the system, by the natural formation mechanism of the system, perhaps uh, find the global minimum of the spin Hamiltonian that then I can read, uh, read out and produce the answer to my problem. So first I need to decide on the element or bit or qubit of the computer spin. Um, Usually, I we think about uh, about the element as some kind of error um, for the Ising error up, error down. Uh, for the X Y Hamiltonian, the error that lives in the unit circle. For qubit, the error or Heisenberg classical Heisenberg Hamiltonian, the error that lives on the on on the sphere. And then we have to um, think of how to introduce the interactions, the couplings between the elements. So how to make them interact. And here we cannot just limit out ourselves to the nearest neighbor interactions. Now, first of all, um, usually the system where we have just next neighbor interaction, nearest neighbor interactions are, can be solved on the classical, classical computer. So there is no, no advantage to build uh, the, the, the simulators, uh, usually um, I expected. Again, mathematically, we know that we can always map any problem, any NP-hard problem onto the, say, Ising Hamiltonian with transverse field with just the nearest neighbor interaction. But unfortunately, we have to have an infinite precision in such coupling. And this is not possible, of course, in experimental system. So we need to go beyond nearest neighbors. And ideally, this system has to have the coupling everything with everything that will minimize the overhead, that will minimize the number of ele elements we have to use in our system. Next requirement that we have to be able to change pairwise interactions independently of the rest. So many platforms now coming um, into play when um, when you have everything coupled with everything, but unfortunately by just changing by ingredient of the coupling, you change the coupling between many spins. And of course, if you would like to have a programmable physical simulator, that's not, that's not good. And also you need to be able to introduce the wide range of couplings. So again, we know that the couplings, when you have only plus or minus one, again, they, there are efficient methods on classical computers that deal with problems like that. So for the hard problems, for the hard objective functions, you really expect that your couplings take, um, take a significant range um, between, between the elements. Very important part that the system, the physical simulator has to have a principle for finding the minimum. Why would it find the global minimum rather than being stuck at the local minima? And many systems, as we know them, when we talked about, for instance, energy minimization, we know that the system most likely to end up at the local minimum. So there have to be some built-in principle why or how we can drive the system to ground state to the global minimum. The system has to be scalable. Again, the most interesting case is that we need to go, um, we need to go and we need to be able to build the simulator with a million or 10 millions, 100 millions elements to compete with, uh, with, the, classical, with the classical computing. And then there are different um, other challenges, but they mostly connected to um, technological um, demands and they usually system specific precision, speed, error corrections, etc. Okay, so why liquid light? Why optical computer? Why um, uh, this system show, uh, show this promise um, of being um, efficient when the simulator is created? So first of all, there is a natural element of optical system in a light wave, an optical pulse. Um, it could be um, laser pulse. For us, it's polariton condensate where the element of the computer is represented by the phase of the wave or the phase of the condensate. So we describe each element in these systems by 
um, a complex function of time. So it's at, at the fixed point, it's, it's a number, complex number in terms of the amplitude and the phase. And the phase becomes this, um, this variable for, for this computer. The interactions in optical systems are easier to implement. Uh, light can be recirculated between different, different elements. We have optical waveguides. We have spatial light modulator where the light can be redirected. And that allows, for instance, how it depicted uh, on this poor, poor man um, optical, optical electronic computer that was recently proposed when the fibers and then there are SLMs and the light is redirected to couple the elements in, in the machine. These machines are easy to scale. We're already talking about coherentizing machine that has 100,000 spins, photonicizing machine of Conti and his collaborators um, implemented 10 million spins. So this is unprecedented scalability um, that has no comparison to other systems at the moment. Um, another important issue is room temperature operation. In polariton condensates, the experiment, the results of the experiments that I'm going to show are actually done in 10 Kelvin in inorganic gallium arsenide samples. But um, the polariton condensation occurs also at room temperature in some organic and polymer, uh, polymers. And therefore, once we hope that once we study the processes at the relative um, warmth of cryogenic temperatures, we can move it to the room temperature operation. Other systems, as you know, the um, coherentizing machine and other optical systems already operate at room temperature. However, there are many problems. So um, one problem is decoherence, and I'm not even talking here about the quantum de decoherence, is simply that if I redirect the light, the coherence will be, will be lost, and I wouldn't be able to couple, for instance. There are questions of whether or not there is quantum speed up in these systems. And in my talk, I will claim that there is actual quantum speed up perhaps in our system, but of course it's a big question to answer for all this uh, for all the systems. And usually we know that most likely they are really quantum uh, classical systems. Um, the question of whether or not system finds the global minimum is crucial. Again, the system is very likely to end up at the local minimum in these systems. And then we have spin glass, and then we have other complications that I'm going actually to talk about. So let me now talk about polariton graph simulator, what it is. So polaritons are quasi particles um, that arise from the superposition of photon and excitons in semiconductor microcavities. So we build the very thin layers of atomic species such as aluminum, gallium, arsenide, indium in such a way that they can uh, trap the light of a particular frequency of a particular color. So as the laser is shined uh, into this um, microcavity, the electron gets, um, uh, gets excited, creating uh, an uh, exciton, electron hole pair. This is an excited state, so it speeds up the speeds out the photons that gets reflected from the mirrors, Bragg reflectors, um, and then another exciton is created, and so this energy being recir recirculated. So we would think about classically about this configuration as exciton or photon, exciton or photon, but there is a superposition that gives rise to this quasi particle um, called exciton polariton or just polariton. So this, depending on the structure, you can make it more light or more matter, but from the light, this particle inherits low mass. It's about five, four, five orders of magnitude lower than the mass of the electron. And from the matter component, it inherits strong interactions. The electron-electron exchange in excitons is the source of the interactions, and these are quite strong, um, much stronger than in ultra-cold BCs, for instance. Uh, polaritons are bosons, uh, so they undergo Bose-Einstein condensation, and because they're so light, they do it at um, rather um, sufficiently large temperatures, let's say, not, not uh, the microkelvin that is required for, um, for ultra-cold BECs. So on this diagram, this is perhaps the most famous diagram from the first paper that reported the observation of Bose-Einstein condensation. So the laser, is, uh, the laser is at high intensity, 
and then uh, the hot carriers are created, hot excitons, that they relax, emit phonons, and then condense at the bottom of so-called lower um, polariton range of the spectra. So the superposition between photon and exciton gives rise to these two, two branches. But uh, after bouncing back and forth between the mirrors, photon gets through uh, the mirrors. Uh, therefore, this is the dissipative system. And to have the steady state, to have um, uh, the stationary configuration, the laser should be constantly on. Okay. All right. So um, the experiments um, that I was involved uh, with um, uh, with um, experimental collaborators were actually first performed at Nanophotonic Center in Cambridge in a group of Jeremy Baumberg. When we first looked at the first uh, lattices of these condensates, uh, looked at the problems of how they interact, what are the relative phases that they establish, put forward the concept of the quantum oscillator. So the idea is that you can create, use, using spatial light modulator, you can create condensates at a particular position of this two-dimensional space. And the polariton uh, are scattered from the position when they were created. Um, they travel rather significant distances away from this, uh, from uh, from the position of where they were created. Just in, just putting in perspective, the size of the polariton condensate is about one two microns, for instance, on this diagram, and the coupling occurs at uh, on fifteen microns in this um, in this experiment. But also, it's possible to take it to like hundred and fifty microns. So two micron in the width uh, um, the condensates actually lock their phases when they separate it to 100 of microns. And this is due to their motion of expanding motion. So in this diagram, on this picture of the energy spectra, you see that this is for a single condensate. So there is a preferred wave number with that characterize the velocity of the propagating condensate. So when I create a single condensate, the velo they start uh, going from the point when they created and they travel large distances, bringing the information about the phases to other condensates in the lattice. But immediately after this first experiments, we started asking questions, how the phase difference is established between the condensate? Because in some configurations, the in phase, they were coupled in phase, sometimes out of phase. In this configuration, it could be with two pi over three difference. And we responded to this challenge. We answered this question with another group of experimentalists. This is now in Skoltek in Russia, uh, in a group of um, uh, Professor Pavlos Logudakis, where we came up with the concept of polariton graph simulator. But first, we understood how the condensates decide which phase difference to establish. So, and this is illustrated on this experimental setup. When we have two condensates at the same in power intensity, um, so they created with the same injection rate, but now we change the distance between them. And you looking at the density of the polaritons, and you can see that here you have this standing wave with um, destructive interference in the middle, indicating that the phase difference that two condensate establish are out of phase, by phase difference. You move them further away. Now you have constructive interference in the center, indicating that now the condensates are in phase, move them even further, again, they out of phase. And to understand why the system establishes this particular phase difference between the condensates, we went to the coupling mechanism because this is Bose-Einstein condensation, it stimulated relaxation of polaritons. And so the phase configuration that is established is the one that maximizes the number of particles, maximizes the occupation. So in other words, as you increase the pump, you drive the system from the below, and the first configuration where the condensates start existing is actually takes place for the phase configuration that makes it possible. So the phase configuration that maximizes the number of particles for the given drive, for the given gain. And then if I write down, therefore, the total occupation in my system, so this is just the square of the amplitudes um, of the wave uh, of the, my wave function of my condensate, 
And then if I substitute in this expansion, the phases of the individual condensates and their wave functions, if the wave function of each condensates, if they were isolated from the rest of the system, then the simple algebraic manipulation will tell me that the total mass would have n condensates plus the term that depends on their couplings. And these couplings depend on the product of the wave function um, that are locally centered um, at uh, position um, Ri, Rj, etc., cetera, where the, where the condensates were created. Looking at the, um, at the mean field description of polariton condensates, we can use an asymptotic expansion and actually obtain the, uh, the form of the coupling between the two condensates in terms of the Bessel function. So in here, uh, delta represents the width of the pumping um, and Kc times D, D is the distance between them and Kc is this characteristic wave number that represents the velocity of the outflowing condensate. And that gives us the changing uh, coupling, the changes in sign and the intensity. So if the sign of the interaction, if this integral is positive, the condensates will lock in phase. If it's negative, they will lock with phi phase difference. But now if I look at this expression, I can see that I'm maximizing the mass. I'm maximizing what I have on the left. The first term in this expansion does not depend on what I do, does not depend on the structure of the lattice, because this is just number of my condensate multiplied at the mass occupation of um, an isolated condensate. And therefore, by maximizing the mass, I'm maximizing this term. Or to put it differently, I'm minimizing the xy, the classical xy Hamiltonian. And that's what we then um, try to illustrate using the simple lattice elements from square lattice, triangular lattice, and then taking it up to, uh, to more condensates. So now 45 condensates, and finally, uh, 100 condensates, um, as this little movie illustrates, in a triangular lattice. This is a slightly different setup where we use the pulsed excitation. And so as the, the occupation um, gets lower and lower and lower, the system goes from uh, all in-phase configuration to outer-phase configuration, as this momentum, momentum space, the Fourier, Fourier image illustrates. Okay, so we confirm that indeed in the simple geometrically coupled lattices, indeed the system arranges the phases between the condensate as to minimize the classical XY Hamiltonian. And so now by changing this geometry, by positioning the condensate at the different location of this two dimensional space, it's possible to, um, to read out on in a matter of picoseconds the answer, the phase distribution between the condensates. Uh, but now let me, um, let me move to the problems that we faced when we tried to scale it up or actually um, make this simulator to do something useful. And these problems are actually ubiquitous in many optical systems if not all optical systems. So um, I will just list these problems and just mentioned um, the sol solution to, to various problems that we envisioned. And then I will maybe go into the details of just a couple of those problems. Okay, so one problem, which again, ubiquitous for optical um, computing that uses phase of the signal uh, as the unit of um, as the element of the computer is the bit. Now, first of all, we use thetas as the bit, but we also have an occupation. So if I have a system and then I pump uniformly, so the injection rate is all the same, because the couplings are different, different elements will have different occupation. And that will either create the situation when you don't even have the steady state, you have two or, or, or more um, oscillating subsystems, or these elements, the occupation, modify the couplings 
Um, and therefore, because you don't know what the occupation is before you started this process, you don't know the couplings of the system. Um, therefore, you are not solving the, the problem that you actually posed. And this is we've seen on this previous slide. Um, the, again, this is the experimental image when we have 45 condensates. And you can see that those condensates are the outskirts and the boundary are not occupied as much as the condensates in the center because they do not have the, the they're fed by the uh, polariton outflow from the condensates. And if these guys get fluxes from, from nine neighbors, um, this guy gets it from, whatever, from five. Therefore, its occupation is much lower. This one gets it only from, whatever, from four. So to overcome this problem, uh, we propose to adjust pumping individually for each condensate and instead to bring them all to the same occupation. That's actually resolve this problem, but you have to introduce the uh, feedback mechanism in your system. And that, of course, is going to slow down its operation. For some systems, when you can know this, uh, this freedom to actually adjust the coupling, for instance, as in Yamamoto coherent Ising machine, you use the pump to actually project in a D uh, DOPIO scheme, um, you cannot do that. Um, we have continuous spins. Ideally, we would like to be able to solve discrete problems instead. Uh, uh, we proposed to do that, we proposed to combine resonant and non-resonant non pumping. And that would allow to project, I will say a few words about this, this would allow to project the spins at the end of the operation at the, cre at the moment the condensates are created and therefore solve not just the XY uh, model, but the Ising model, find the, uh, the global mean of the Ising model. If we have the simulator where each element is fixed, then of course we cannot just use the geometry of the couplings. Um, instead, we would like to have the fixed geometry, but be able to change the pairwise interactions. And this can be achieved, but you need to introduce some kind of dissipative channels and gates. So that would be probably best achieved if there is a very large dissipation uh, to disallow the interaction between uh, across the diagonals and then you use the special gates to control um, to control just the interaction between the neighbors but again this this scheme only allows again to use the nearest neighbor interactions but ideally would like to use long range interaction this is a, a ongoing work with um, Alberto Amo and Jacqueline Block with their experiments in, um, in Lille and Paris, where they use micropillars. So the condensation takes place on micropillars, and then we recycle the light using LS, uh, SL, SLM to use the photons that one of the condensate emits to recycle them and therefore provide the information to the other condensates about the phase of other condensate. So for instance, we, we, in, this, uh, in this geometry, we were able to couple all elements with uh, with the rest of the system, all with all, but on uh, small uh, small systems, the condensates. Um, for some pro another problem that some uh, problems are better to be mapped into uh, tensors into K local Hamiltonians, and then we uh, propose how to combine light signals to actually implement the tensorial minimization. And this is rather interesting problem by itself because if um, each tensor problem of this type can be mapped into the Ising Hamiltonian, but you need to introduce two additional spins to decrease the, um, the degree of each term and also in introduce the wider range of coupling. So it actually makes this process, makes the problem much harder. So it's easy, for instance, to solve the tensorial problem, but once you map into the Ising, it becomes impossible to solve. Another important question that I would like to spend more time on um, today is how do we compare the work of simulators? Because there are many machines that uh, use this principle of trying to find the minimum of the spin Hamiltonian. 
these are optoelectronic oscillators, these are coherentizing machine in different um, disguises, microwave photonics, nanolasers, nano lasers in the cavity, et cetera, et cetera. They all have different topology. They have dif different coupling range, size, speed. So how do we compare this, uh, these machines and how do we decide that actually the machine is doing something useful? And then finally, um, uh, another important thing that I mentioned is that the systems often find the local minimum instead of the global minimum. And then we propose different ways of how to remedy this problem and how actually drive the system system to, uh, to, the, ground, to the ground state, to the true global minimum. Okay, so uh, let me spend um, some time going through some of these, uh, some of these ideas. And the first idea is the problem with densities, uh, density heter heterogeneities. The problem that if you have different couplings in optical systems, then it's quite likely that um, the occupation of individual elements will be different, and that's this is going to pr uh, to create a problem. So let me let me explain uh, what I mean. Um, if I take, I didn't put, put down the mean field equation for polariton condensates. Um, they are very similar to lasers, but they have the, uh, the wave function of the condensate in some form of the complex ginsburg landau equation coupled to the uh, equation on the evolution of the reservoir. And you can have two or three stage, stage systems, quite uh, sophisticated. But... Um, you can integrate the spatial degree, uh, spatial degree of freedom out and extract the essential ingredient of the operation of your simulator. And it will have the form, some Stuart Landau system. So we have the rate, of, so we have a system, each element of the system, which condensate is described by this uh, complex number Psi J, which is a function of time. And then you have the injection rate the linear losses, they have the saturable nonlinearity, so there is uh, nonlinearity in the dissipation. Uh, there are self interactions, laser system probably don't have this term, uh, but it, it affects the dynamics, but not, not crucially. And then you have these couplings between the elements and uh, some noise, it could be quantum noise, it could be, it could be classical noise. So if I evolve the system, if I start rising the injection rate to some threshold value, then for the fixed point, I expect the densities to take some, uh, some values, the, the just fixed point of the system. And close to that threshold, uh, my system, the phases of the system behave as chromoto oscillators. And as you can see, I don't know these densities before I finish the process, but these densities are modifying the couplings. And although this equation indeed describes the gradient descent to, uh, to, uh, to some minimum, this minimum is not going to be the true minimum of the, of the XY Hamiltonian. To resolve this problem, we need to set some occupation to which we will drive our system to and then adjust the individual injections according, accordingly. So we decrease if the occupation exceeded the goal and we keep increasing the, the injection if um, it still didn't reach the goal. And in this case, we, if this feedback is implemented that indeed at the, at the fixed point, we have the total mass, which is just the number of the condensate times the occupation to which we, our system was driven, and then we have the total injection, to, uh, total loss, and the minimum of the XY Hamiltonian. And since the left-hand side is fixed, and we're always choosing the smallest possible injection, we drive our system from below, we know that the system is going to find the minimum of the XY Hamiltonian. And then close to the threshold, we have also Kramot oscillators, and they are identical because they're all driven to the same to the same kind of natural natural frequency. And maybe I'll show this little little movie how it works on a system of 20, um, 20 condensates all coupled with the rest. So we keep pumping uniformly, and then some of the condensates shoot up, and then we decrease the pump for those. Um, some continue to grow, we keep increasing the gain, 
until the system equilibrates and um, at the uh, the minimum of the xy Hamiltonian. So it continues, continues to go. Now I think it's the fixed point will be reached when all the densities are equilibrated to the same a priori decided value. Let me mention some of the extensions. So I mentioned the possibility to also simulate, uh, emulate and find the global minimum of the Ising Hamiltonian. And this is achieved if we combine non-resonant pump with a resonant at uh, the resonance n equal, n equal two and slowly bring up so this term then plays the role of the projection, like in dopules, for instance, and then we can drive the system to actually minimize the, uh, the, the Ising Hamiltonian instead. In our system, we have natural presence of the complex coupling. Sometimes we can uh, diminish those complex coupling, but actually they could play the positive role because they allow us to span the, uh, the hyperspace of the, of the function that we're minimizing. So if this term is present, then instead of the Kuramoto oscillators, now we have sign with this leg. So these are uh, Sokaguchi Kuramoto models that displaces the fixed point for small k and it completely destabilizes the system for large k. And by invoking temporarily this term, we can allow the system to go until the true ground state is found. So this little diagram shows that we have a system where there are four lower ground state, lower energy state where system is almost equally likely to be trapped by. But then as we start exercising this um, complex coupling switching, actually all trajectory go to the true ground state of the system. And that for the tensor min, um, minimization, we can have this higher order terms that, that also allows to actually um, now solve this type of, uh, of problems of the tensorial minimization, key, finding the key local Hamiltonians, minimum of the key local Hamiltonians. Okay, um, let me now uh, talk about do I have yeah so let me now talk about the principle of operation perhaps the most crucial um, part in the operation of these machines so what does machine do and how does does it find the local uh, local or global minimum and how do we know that the machine does something useful and um, I'll so this this little diagram shows some of the recent papers that tested their machine, their physical machines using so-called Merbius letters. So they were solving uh, the Ising model. So finding the global minimum of the Ising Hamiltonian uh, where the connections between the links between the nodes corresponded to Merbius letters. So there were three connections for each element um, and they had this structure. So this kind of, that what it gives Mobius letter uh, its uh, meaning to the terminology, Mobius letter. So think about these connections as being anti-ferromagnetic that trying to make the neighboring, the connected spins to be uh, in opposite configuration. So with five phase difference. So clearly the system is frustrated. There would be many degenerate states. Uh, and we know what the global minimum is going to be. The global minimum is going to be where we can um, create this, this um, uh, opposite spins for any two um, spins, connected spins, except for two. So there are, for instance, here they're shown in red. So I need to violate the, um, the, the so these two spins connected with red would be in the same, uh, in the same direction. So this is where, this um, uh, anti-ferromagnetic links will be, will be violated. So the Möbius letters have been extensively used in uh, testing for, uh, for all these machines, showing some successes. So there would be some classical algorithm 
ran and then uh, they would be the action the, the the action of the machine for instance for dopios the reported success with finding um, uh, ground state 21 percent of the time for optoelectronic networks 34 percent of the time whereas with well electronic machines it's only three percent of the time and then for some reason the classical classical solvers were performing e even worse the problem is that actually these uh, letters, these, uh, these structures, these Ising Hamiltonians are perfectly suited to the operation of all these machines. Because what these machines do, they really favor the principal eigenvector. So they find the state that corresponds to the sign of the components of the eigenvector that corresponds to the largest eigenvalue. So if we take any mathematical model that describe any of these machines, in essence, they represent the operation of the Hopfield tank networks. So you have the variables that are real variables that change in time um, according to some constant multiplied by, by, uh, by the state, plus the connectivity matrix Jij multiplied by V, where V is some sigmoid think about it as hyperbolic tangent, for instance, that squashes, that takes um, xj uh, to take the value between minus one and one. So the action of the dynamics of these networks are very well understood. They minimize the uh, Lapinov functional in this form. And already you can see that for a fixed and non-zero tau, you don't minimize the Ising Hamiltonian because you have this extra term. And in the action of, again, if your tangent does not, um, it doesn't have very steep slope, right? If it does, if it does not project it to minus one and one, then you're not going to have all the spins to take the values of exactly plus or minus one. They take some other values that then project it and present it as plus or minus spins. But this, uh, this energy functional is close to the minimum of the XY model, but it's not exact. But it's exact only if you have this principle of the operation of the machine that favors the principal eigenvector. And on this diagram, for instance, I show how we simulated the simple Hopfield net network taking a very gentle tangent. So at the end of our simulation, we have spins that are very far from minus one and one. Then we project them on plus or minus one, take them as minimize of Ising Hamiltonian and show that indeed this is the state that gives us the global minimum of the Möbius letter. And if you have, and but you need to have enough iterations. If you don't have, don't take enough inter, uh, iterations, then you can undershoot and then end up at the high energy levels than the one uh, that you're looking for. Okay, so that perhaps explains why this operation was, was so disappointing in spite of the fact that actually this particular example is specific for the operation of, this, of, this, of all these machines. Okay. And the Möbius, there is nothing particularly uh, about the Möbius letter because there is a large class of problems that does exactly the same. And here I mentioned some other um, very commonly chosen um, uh, graphs for to sh that, that use in different machines to show how good the machines are. But all of those machines have exactly the same property that the true global minimum corresponds to the sign of the components of the principal eigenvector. And this is what the machine favors during its operation. But you don't have to take these graphs uh, for testing. You need to take different graphs for testing. And for instance, one route is to start with Möbius letter and then rewire. So take randomly two uh, connections and replace them with two different connections that don't exist in the system before. And the more such rewiring step you, steps you make, the further you go from the minimum to be represented by this principal eigenvector. And the harder it becomes for the solvers, for these optical solvers to find the true solution. And for instance, already with 
5% of rewiring, you actually have this very steep growth in complexity. So in from the engineering point of view, it should not be hard to just rewire in Merbius letter just two to 5% of the links, but it's already it takes you away from the graph that has this particular property. And you can take other system, it could be the Gaussian couplings, it could be um, other types of max cut, regular max cut, it could be spin glass torus, it could be um, sherrington Kirkpatrick models. And then, but another thing that you can notice is that if I take a sufficiently small uh, lattice, for instance, if I take 20 um, elements in my machine, and then I notice that I still have, as I start generating these other matrices, there is still very good probability that I will hit easy instance. By easy instance here, I mean that again, this property that the global minimum corresponds to the principal eigenvector is there. So it could be misleading. You start with a very small matrix, 10, 20 elements, and you show very good behavior. But as you go to the larger sizes, then there would be rapid deterioration of your machine because all it can do is to find the easy solution and it will fail to find any other solutions. Okay, so um, again, we have many, many simulators now coming almost every day, presenting various platforms as analog simulators um, and they all share problems uh, I even uh, type it twice. So common problems, common principles of operations, and we really need to uh, think part of how we test and how we prove that um, the, the machine is actually doing something, something useful. And so the questions uh, that we need to ask whenever machine, whenever a new simulator comes our way is first of all, does the system really minimizes the correct objective? As you can see in this example that I showed, if the operation of the machine is very similar to Hoffield tank, and so far most of the problem, most of the um, most of the simulators that we experience with, they do behave as Hoffield tank. They minimize the wrong Hamiltonian. You think you minimize one thing, but you minimize another thing, and you don't see this difference because you've just chosen the Hamiltonian that has this property that you minimize something different, but it's simply the global, global minimum of these two Hamiltonians happen to coincide. Problem with density heterogeneity. Again, you're minimizing something that has coupling coefficients that depend on different densities and you don't know the densities before you finish your minimization. So again, you're solving the wrong problem. Presence of coupling, uh, complex couplings. I mentioned it as a blessing. So we can, if we have this, um, this way of, as in polariton condensate, to turn on and off the complex couplings, this is good. We can, by doing that, we can drive the system to the global minimum um, in, in many settings. However, often in this optical system, the couplings are complex and it cannot be controlled. For instance, the complex part of the coupling will come from Josephson coupling rather than dissipative coupling. Sometimes the presence of external potentials or even in geometrical couplings, we have some contribution of this complex coupling. That leads to the wrong minimum or to oscillations in the system. It never reaches the solution. Very important question whether or not there is a global or local minimum. We need to be able um, to, to drive the system to find the, the global minimum rather than it's been stuck at the local minimum. Is the problem sufficiently hard? The one that you're testing your simulator on, is it hard or it simply represents the property of the system itself and you're solving, you're proving, uh, preaching to the choir? Performance for small uh, number of elements is not indicative of performance for large n. Again, as you've seen in the previous example, it just happened that you hit for small uh, n, you hit the large percentage of easy instances, again, that correspond to the operation of your machine. Very important question, again, that has a lot of discussion, quantum speed up. Um, in our system, there is an element of that, because when the system is geometrically coupled, 
because as we um, the process of the bose einstein condensation is quantum but when the condensate is created the system behaves semi-classically it behaves classically however before the system is condensed there is we hope that there is this really quantum speed up that there is entanglement that there are some there, there is some uh, quantum noise present in the system so we think of the process of condensation that when the condensate is created is analogous to measurement in quantum system so you have everything quantum you measured you have classical system you have everything quantum you measured and you condense and that's when you have the classical system but we don't have the proof for the for the quantum speed up um, yet um, and the last last point loss of coherence yes it's again dissipative system uh, if uh, there is a drift of the of the phase with time but as i mentioned uh, we we work on this and we already in spite of this loss of the coherence uh, the coupling between the condensates actually can be established uh, with SLM. So it's not enough, even though there is a loss of coherence, the fact that you're constantly, um, the constantly uh, in the coupling state, that allows the, uh, the condensates to synchronize. And even, you know, in this, when you geometrically coupled, you have two condensates separated by uh, orders of magnitude, larger distances than the size of the condensate, and they still they still um, coupled coherently for 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 as long as um, the laser is on, as long as the system uh, is on. And so um, I would like to uh, to stop, and I I would be delighted to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much for the great talk. Um, questions from the audience? Uh, hi, Natalia. I, oh yes, sorry. Uh, should I? Uh, ah, yes, yeah. I know. Sorry. I, yeah, yeah. So now I can see. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, I uh, yeah. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm a grad student in Ben Lab's lab. Um, we're working on a machine that could potentially be one such uh, Ising solver, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, we're studying the sort of J matrices that we can produce in our system. And um, one of the things we've been studying is when is it an easy instance of a J matrix. Um, from the perspective of when is the principal eigenvector the solution of the problem. Um, I was wondering, maybe I just missed this during your talk, are there other common ways in which a J matrix can be easy in some sense, or are there, are there other maybe easy instance types that we should look out for as we're studying our J matrices? Um, it depends, um, because, you know, it's it's a very it's a very good it's it's a very good question. The reason why I emphasized the principle this that uh, the matrices that uh, for which the global minimum is just the principal eigenvector is that this corresponds to the operation of these optical machines. That's how they they operate. So here you can see that if if I'm using, if the underlying principle is similar to the Hopefield tank network and, you know, coherentizing machines, you know, you know, pretty much every time they can be reduced to the Hopefield tank network. So in this case, indeed, it's the largest eigenvalue that drives the process of minimizing the, the Hamiltonian. Okay, mm -hmm. so this principle is specific for this machine. Mm -hmm. Right, so these particular matrices are easy for the for the machine. That those matrices, J matrices, that have this property, they will be easy for this machine. They may not be easy for any other machine that that is um, that operates with a different different principle. You know, you know what, sure, sure. what I'm saying. It's just for the same uh, for the same um, the same idea is that it's not enough to say the hard matrices are easy by just looking at the spectral gap. We got used to think that the spectral gap is the one that controls the uh, the, the hardness, mm -hmm. but for these machines, it's not because simply the first excited state may not be stable. Even they may or it may have very small basin of attraction for the dynamical network that governs the system, so it will be completely irrelevant to the operation of your machine. Sure, sure, okay. So, so to understand, to answer your question, to understand what, what are the types of easy matrices is you need to look at what is the governing principle and then say, you know, what does this, this model do? I mean, where does it take me? 
And then if for these matrices, it always takes you to, to find a solution, I mean, that's an easy, that's an easy matrix. But another, another, I mean, this is what we've done, for instance, in this, on this, um, in, uh, what I showed on this diagram. So if I start with an easy matrix and start making it harder, mm -hmm. how do I determine, you know, what is hard and what is not? In our case, for this paper, we use Gurobi. So this is method that simply finds, finds the exact solution. Uh, so we give the optimality gap. So we want the system for the given time to be to find to find the solution, and then we say if it's if it does does that, uh -huh. right? And so for the Gurobi already gives you the representation that you know that already makes it harder. Yeah. But again, it it makes it harder for Gurobi. For some other method, maybe it, it, it's not hard. Sure, sure, sure. So it's a bit of objective. So, yeah, so you need to see what is the essence of the of the machine of your machine, right? You know, the, the, what is the dynamics of this machine, and then see, you know, what would be the easy easy um, instances that follow the same operational principle for which the global minimum maybe it has very large basin of attraction. Yeah, yeah. All the sizes they don't. I mean, that's that's what determines what is it, how that's easy they make. Because I guess we see. Right out of phase transition, we see the our system initially goes into this eigenvector state, but then does some other stuff. So I've been thinking that the interesting part of the machine is probably as it goes away from that initial eigenvector solution. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So again, each of this uh, each of these machine would would be slightly different, right? There will be deviation from Hopfield pen, and you need to make this deviation that actually allows you to go somewhere else. It's like you know, for for the same reason. I mean, if I go to my to my machine, you know, it operates like that, right? So again, the whole field tank is built, but I need to somewhere, but I need to make few steps, you know, yeah. to, to go there. So it, it does something else. It misses some of the, of the uh, excited state perhaps, because again, they don't have good basin of attraction, right? And then I modify my machine. So I, I'm putting these complex couplings in for some periods of time. What it does, it destabilizes all the minima that exist in my, in my in my model. It's either shifted by this phase lag, or it becomes so large that actually minimum cannot be found. So it just starts going into the limit cycle. Yeah, yeah, great. Right. Yeah. So then, by just adding one term, I completely change the behavior of my system. So now it will not follow anything re resembling principal eigenvalue. It may not even settle. Sure, sure, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very helpful. So in other words, I mean, once the root is you, 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 you model your system, you know how it operates, and then you start using, you know, classical simulation to understand what governs my behavior of my machine. And what should I tweak? What should I change? Which controls to use that I actually change that I guide the trajectory so it goes to, uh, to the global minimum. Yeah, that is uh, that is precisely what we're doing. <laughs> yes, um, and I think what is successful. I mean, can you say a few words on, on what I mean? What is the success probability? What uh, oh, problem uh, size of the lattice? It's very early. I think I think I should hesitate before I give any numbers so far. But I uh, I would be happy to share with you as soon as there are some. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, I would be happy to you know to 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 discuss you know after I'll, after. I'll keep it in mind. Thanks. Yeah. Um, if you're okay, we'll take one more question before wrapping up. Hi, hello. Could, Hi. May I ask a question? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Oh, good, okay. So I'm Steve Harris here. On the par the parametric systems, there's a, I'm not sure this is related to, to your, what you're calling quantum speed up, but in the parametric systems, there's a clear distinction when H bar omega is larger or smaller than KT. Uh, so, uh, if, if if it's okay, and yeah, because I'm not sure it's the same thing you're calling speed up, do you expect a, a a real difference in behavior when we move into the regime where kT is small as compared to kT larger than h bar omega? It's hard to say. Um, again, the problem is you. Um, In, my, in our case, in the case of Clariton condensate, uh, 
it's 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 more clear it's it's a, it's it's you know because you don't have the condensate you only have condensate at the end of um, uh, this uh, the process of condensation right it's quantum process but we don't know to which extent really the speed up of, you know whether it helped at all even here we don't know but at least we know that yes the process is quantum and we may hope that there were you know the system was capable of spanning a larger number of possibilities before it, you know, reached the condensation state. For the parametric oscillator, for of course, the, there are several implementation, right, uh, of how the couplings were achieved, and the couplings there are done in classical way, right. If you use FPGA, they already you read out the phase and then you uh, you couple everything all with all, or even if you use the time delay, the pulse has to form before you start combining it with other pulses. So here, I think the system, you know, it's still, you know, they, they, they are quantum effects, but our computer has quantum effect, right? So to which extent this really gives the speed up is much less, um, less justified, I think. Okay, it's still because the coupling takes place already when you know you're you formed your pulses right so if bj you it's already classical you already do in our case the condensation you know before the condensate is created everything is quantum so the, there are still many more possibilities for uh for um polaritons to to interact in, in tangle and perhaps find a better better configuration but again we have we don't have measurements i mean this is just some ideas that uh, that we have to prove that there is a there is a speed up thank you so, so the short answer is i i don't think there is <laughs> uh and less likely in opio thank you Right. So I know we have a lot more questions, but um, we are running out of time. So let's go ahead and thank our speaker for a great talk. I would be delighted to to answer. I mean, are they written? Oh, I can I can stay and just answer. Oh, maybe I need yeah. to give you back the. Uh, I stop sharing. <laughs>